At the end of last year, the new Commodore C64 Maxi was released. It allows you to play a limited number of good old games. But we can do better thanks to RetroPie. It turns your Raspberry Pi into a full game emulator, allowing you not only to play C64 games, but also Atari, Amiga and Game Boy games. Even more, with the latest Raspberry Pi 4, we have enough processing power to run a normal desktop computer. Let's build the ultimate Raspberry C64 Pi computer. First, we need a C64. You can buy a second-hand machine straight from the 80s, but then you will need a keyboard adapter to be able to use the case's keyboard. A much easier way is the new Commodore C64 Maxi. I ordered it online and it arrived right on time. Its integrated keyboard uses USB and the casing is practically empty. We have plenty of space to place all our components. Even the side panel features a USB hub that we could utilize. It is 3 by 11 centimeters. We can keep the original C64 Maxi computer completely intact and use it as a backup entertainment system. The main components I want to place are the Raspberry Pi 4, an SSD drive and a power supply. The goal is to boot the Raspberry Pi from the SSD, which would speed up the little computer considerably. The internal SD card reader is not particularly fast. The Raspberry Pi and its official power supply do not have an on-off switch. I also do not want to carry another box with me. It makes much more sense to integrate a power supply into the case and then simply plug it into the mains. I selected the Meanwell NES35 power supply. It provides 5 volts and up to 7 ampere. 3 ampere are recommended for the Raspberry Pi 4, but running an SSD and other external equipment might drain some additional power. Better to be on the safe side with some extra capacity. I selected a 240GB Western Digital SSD since it offers a good price value. This should be enough for the operating system, additional programs and space for some documents. This will not hold your movie or photo library. Raspbian does not yet have a native support for booting from a USB drive on a Raspberry Pi 4. When selecting a USB to SATA connector, I consulted James Chambers' recommendations for a compatible chipset and picked the StarTech adapter. Time for a quick shopping tour. While the main components are readily available, it becomes a bit more difficult when looking for connectors that can be integrated into the C64 case. For this, we need some online shopping, which will require shipping. So let's order all the parts before continuing the build. We need an HDMI, Ethernet, audio and power connector. There are hundreds of choices for each of them, but we only have a limited space on the case. We also want to easily install the connectors. Cutting out a rectangular shape is much more difficult than drilling a hole. The case is 4mm thick, which is a lot of plastic to get through. The Adafruit adapters only require a 30mm hole and no soldering is required, which is always a plus. It would be possible to create a custom I.O. plate, but the three USB plugs and the hub behind it can just be used for the Raspberry Pi. For this we need an adapter to plug the USB cable into the Pi. It took me some time to find out that this is a JST-PH connector type. Keeping the original cable untouched allows us to revert back to the complete original C64 setup if desired. Picking the right connector for the power has been a major challenge. There are no good round solutions and finding the smallest possible took some time. While there are some connectors that can be screwed in place, their holes are far too close to the cutout. This might be possible for a metal panel, but I worry that the plastic of the C64 case might snap. There are several snap-in-place solutions, but their panel thickness only extends to 3mm. I could not find a connector for the 4mm thick walls of the case. Maybe a bit of hot glue will do the trick. While waiting for the rest of the components to arrive, it is time to work on the case. 
How can we place all this gear into the case? The C64 has some pillars which can be conveniently be used to mount a board that will hold all our components. The first step is to measure all the relevant internal elements. I then modeled them in Fusion 360 and added the mounting holes for the Raspberry Pi, the SSD and the power supply. The technical documentation provided me with most of the necessary information. I then created a 2D drawing that I printed. Paper pins allowed me to test if the holes are all in the right place. This form of early prototyping turned out to be extremely useful. I was able to move the elements around so that none of the case mounting screws would be covered by the components. Next, I bought a sheet of aluminium and taped the print on it. I then used a needle tool to pinch little markers into the aluminium sheet. I marked the edges of the plate with a knife and used a jigsaw to cut out the shape onto the drill press to drill the holes for the components and for the mounting holes. The power supply's documentation was ambiguous on the exact location of the mounting screw holes and hence I decided to wait with drilling the holes until I had the chance to take accurate measures. Now it is time to file down the sharp edges from the drilling and the cutting. There is no reason to shed blood on this project. The moment of truth has come. Will the mounting plate fit into the case? The push pins are again useful to test if the holes align. Let's see if the holes for the devices are all aligned. Spacers are necessary to mount the Raspberry Pi, since otherwise some of its components would touch the plate. Moreover, the Raspberry Pi is located on top of a case screw hole. The spacer allows me to mount the Pi after the plate will be screwed to the case. It also allows the USB and Ethernet plugs to reach the Pi over the SSD. And here we have a first problem. The SATA connector cable cannot connect on an SSD that is mounted directly to the plate. We need some spacers for the SSD. I had these very small plastic spacers that fit perfectly, but are a bit tricky to mount. So far, so good. Time for another fitting test. Will the case close? The Raspberry Pi is too high up at the edge of the case, preventing it from closing. No problem, I had several lower spacers. But now the Ethernet and USB connectors do not reach over the SSD. Let's compromise. The lower spacers go towards the edge and the higher towards the SSD. The Raspberry Pi is now mounted at an angle, similar to that of the keyboard. The case is now closing nice and tightly. The order arrived and I tried to fit the power supply into the case. The power supply was too high and the case would not close. I tried if the power supply would fit when mounted to the case directly and the case did close. Not all hope is lost. Time to become creative. I cut the aluminium plate with a cutter and then bent the plate twice into an S shape. Using clamps helped to create a straight band. I had to sacrifice one of the pillars to allow the plate to reach the bottom of the case. After placing the power supply, I tested if the case would close and it did. Next, I marked the holes for the power supply and drilled them into the plate. Time to fit all the main components to the plate and to screw the plate onto the case. The case did close after minor adjustment of the upper case. All the main cables also connect to the components. I replaced the high spacers for the Pi with just some screws to save a few millimeters of height. The first plug to be placed into the case is the audio plug. The 3.5 millimeter adapter nicely fits into the bottom case and it only requires a minor drill. The case is too thick to fit the bolt, so I simply hot glued the audio adapter. I marked the holes for the Ethernet and HDMI plug and drilled a small guiding hole into the centers. I then used a full-size drill bit to cut out the holes. 
The power switch is a bit trickier since it is in a rectangular shape. I marked the shape and drilled some large holes to take away as much material as possible. Time to cut out and file the exact shape of the rectangular. Repeated filing and fitting allowed me to find the exact necessary cutout. Last, I used some hot glue to secure the switch. I then screwed the HDMI and Ethernet connector to the case. Now it is time to work on the cabling. I started by soldering the power cables to the switch before attaching the other end to the power supply. Time for a first power test. I plugged in the mains to test if the switch was working and if the power supply does give me the expected 5 volts. There were no problems so I secured the cable with the cable tie and used a hairdryer to shrink the cable shrink. I used simple jumper cables to connect the power supply to the two pins of the Raspberry Pi. Connecting the USB hub and the USB keyboard to the Pi requires a bit of tricky soldering. I don't just want to cut the original cables and solder it to a spare USB cable. Instead, I wanted to continue using the JSTPH connectors so that I can reconnect both devices back to the C64 computer if desired. I cut an old USB cable just to find out that it only had two lanes. That will come in handy later. Another cable sacrifice later, I had a proper four lane cable. After removing the insulation and preparing the ends, I carefully soldered it onto the connector. I used heat shrink to secure the cables since the pins were very close together. And all of this had to be done twice. The LED of the C64 can be connected directly with a jumper cable to the pins of the Pi. Time to connect all the cables except for the SSD. We first have to do some software magic. I downloaded the latest version of Raspbian and wrote it to the SD card, which I then put into the Pi. Time for the first full function test. I connected the open case to the main power, monitor and Ethernet network. I was so nervous when I first switched it on. And it booted! I then turned around the upper case and connected a mouse. Both the mouse and the keyboard were working. Time for some tidying up. I hot glued the JSTPH connectors to increase their safety and used cable ties to better manage all the cables. Respian does not yet natively support booting from a USB drive and hence we need some Linux magic documented by James. We write Raspbian to the SSD and already now do we see how much faster the drive is. We first boot without the SSD being connected and then work through some commands before attaching the drive. We then have to execute even more commands before we can boot from the SSD drive. The SD card is still necessary as a bootloader, so we need to keep it plugged in. And voila! The Raspberry Pi boots from the SSD. And now for the cherry on top. The power supply has enough capacity to power both the Raspberry Pi and the C64 board. The later receives its power through a micro USB port and its contacts are far too small for soldering cables to it. There are several unused USB connections on the C64 board. After some initial testing, I decided to solder power cables to one of them. The C64's power supply is specified as 5 volts and 1 ampere. My power supply has enough capacity for this. Time to close the case and get ready for work. Now we can run the Raspberry Pi and the C64 in parallel. I connected each of them with an HDMI cable to my TV and I can now switch between the two platforms.
here it is, the fabulous Raspberry C64 Pi computer. Installing RetroPi is now only one command line away. I also have some other improvements in mind that I will cover in my next video. Check out the link below for some additional information. Enjoy!